campus. Um, Jim Lomax, uh, who's on our board, uh, was one of the original um, individuals who helped put this together. And um, we had Lois Wessendorf, a lady who provided um, and really, I think, put a burr under some people's uh, saddles to do something that would bring together psychotherapy and faith. So that's where this conference started. Uh, the Henderson Wessendorf Foundation has underwritten a part of this and uh, wanted to acknowledge it. It's not in your brochure, but they gave money last year and we had enough to, to use it also this year. So we greatly appreciate uh, the Henderson Wessendorf Foundation. Our co-sponsors are the Menninger Clinic. Uh, you, you know, you, you can't have anything better than the Menninger Clinic. And then also um, the psychiatric department at Baylor College of Medicine, maybe just Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, let me give you a couple of uh, details. First of all, there are only, uh, apparently there's uh, small bathrooms, small serve on this floor. There's some on the floor below. And we feel with the large crowd, it would be better if you need to go to the restroom, you just step out and go, because otherwise at the breaks, it's gonna be a madhouse. So consider that. Um, I want to, call attention to uh, several people that have really worked hard uh, at the Menninger Clinic, and I'm, she's probably at a table somewhere, uh, Stephanie Cunningham, uh, at, um, and then also at Menninger, Nancy Trowbridge. She did a lot on the beautiful brochure. She's done that three, three years in a row, I think. And Terlyn Steele uh, for countless hours uh, on the continuing education aspects of this. At the Institute, uh, Jerry Doctor has probably talked to a thousand people this last week uh, and also arranging all the food and everything and bringing the packets out. Uh, I know she's also back there. Maybe she can hear what I'm saying, but we really appreciate it. And Jim Bankston, um, the senior minister here at um, St. Paul's United Methodist. Jim, or where are you? Is Jim available? Uh, he just stepped around the corner too. We really appreciate their uh, opening the facility to us, and uh, it's uh, always a blessing to come here. And the Fondren Foundation, or, or whoever, uh, has, uh, I know it's the Fondren Hall, I assume the Fondren Foundation uh, helped refurbish this this year, so it's quite beautiful. Uh, let me see. I have one other important thing to tell you. All right, now you have a folder. On the left-hand side of the folder is an application for continuing education and a I hope you're listening. Sign the application and turn it in um, to Jerry Doctor as you leave, or Linda Pownell, uh, who will be standing at the door when we leave at the end of the session. I think you know that uh, we will, um, you must attend all five lectures to get credit. I, uh, someone thought of that, and I guess it's a brilliant idea. You have to attend the entire day, and that'll be till about 3 or 3.30, something like that. Um, I'm going to pass this to uh, Jim Lomax at this time, who's from Baylor College of Medicine. If you will, give a warm welcome to Jim Lomax, one of the original founders of this conference. Thanks, John. The, the other person who's been with me since the start is Linda Pownall, who many of you have uh, met is on your way in. Linda has been my uh, staff person for 35 years, which probably qualifies her for sainthood. And, uh, Bader College of Medicine, Stuart Udowski, John Oldham, and I are delighted to have been a part of this, uh, this conference, and we are especially in the last several years grateful for John Graham and Lex Gillen, who have really helped this uh, conference to grow in a really rewarding and, and amazing sort of way. We're uh, grateful for the uh, work with John Allen to help us the last, last couple of years and for his increasing involvement with the Institute for Spirituality and Health. Uh, the way we're going to do the question and answer portion of the, the uh, conference today is in your packet you also have five uh, little three by five white cards. So I'd like to ask you to write your questions on those cards Lex and a couple of other people will be coming by to pick them up in the center aisles uh, towards the end of the 
session, uh, each uh, particular session, I'll make uh, some introductory comments and then we'll have, I'll ask the, your questions to the, uh, the, the, the presenters. With that, I'm going to ask John Allen to come to say something about Menninger and also to introduce Dr. Shaver. Thanks, Jim. I'm very proud, actually, that Menninger has uh, joined the Institute in sponsoring these conferences and uh, thank Jim for involving me in particular in this process. And just to echo what John Graham said, this is our fourth year in uh, co-sponsoring this event and we did have a lot of woman power. Um, Nancy Trowbridge with the brochure and Terry Lynn Steele with the CE credits, Stephanie Cunningham really was the main liaison with the Institute and Bree Scott too should be mentioned as she's helped with the registration. So I am uh, thrilled actually to uh, be able to introduce Phil Shaver and he didn't want me to say anything about him because I think he's just keen to get up here and talk but I'm going to take a couple of minutes. You have a, he has a 66 page uh, CV <laughs> which I won't go through. You have a bio sketch in the brochure. Uh, it might be hard for you until you hear him to appreciate his contribution to the field of attachment. He's co-authored two major really foundational texts in the field and I want to mention them. The Handbook of Attachment is an edited book edited with Jude Cassidy. This is a thousand pages of double column print that is the, really is the foundation for the field. It's in its second edition now and he tells me that they're going to do a third edition. So this is, this is the book that anchors all of us in the field of attachment. And then uh, with his colleague uh, Mario Michelinzer, he's uh, authored a book on adult attachment, which like the handbook is basically a foundational book that I think me and everybody else <laughs> relies on for our basic understanding of attachment theory. And F Phil has pioneered a major line of research in attachment theory, which is social psychological research, that he really got that entire field off the ground. So uh, his, his contributions are astounding. Had I not known that he was not a clinical psychologist, I, I I wouldn't have believed it. He, uh, hearing him talk, he is every bit a clinician and I think this, the helpful thing to all of you is that he really, although he's an academic and a researcher, he's, he is, he's a humanist, I guess is what I want to say, and really applies this, uh, all of this research to the things that matter to us most. And uh, the last thing I want to say is uh, I've come to think of attachment theory as the foundation of all our clinical work. And I, I make the bold statement to our patients that the single best way to regulate emotional distress is proximity to somebody with whom you are securely attached. This is the most powerful way we have of dealing with our distress. We're a social species. And the other thing is that insecure attachment relationships are the most potent generator of our emotional distress. So attachment really is at the core, I think, of suffering and healing from suffering. And so I think it is just wonderful that we have Phil here to educate us about attachment theory because it really, in my view, sets the foundation for this entire conference in the best possible way. So join me in welcoming Phil. Now does it work? Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Sean, for that lovely introduction. Um, what I'm going to try to do is summarize about 25 years of research <laughs> in a relatively short time. And it, so toward the end, it, in order to get to Buddhism, I may skip sex. That's the part of <laughs> my talk that almost always gets left out, unfortunately. What I'd like to do today is explain this line of research John is mentioning about 
extending Bowlby and Ainsworth's uh, attachment theory and Ainsworth's uh, research contribution into the area. Originally, what we were trying to do is understand romantic love, an adult attachment. And as you'll see, it's sort of expanded w way out of anything we expected. And for the purposes of uh, today's conference, I want to focus on this idea of security because I agree with John. It's still a mystery to me exactly how this works, but I'll show you what we know about it so far. And at the end, admit that there probably is a grand theory uh, hidden somewhere that this is a clue to, but I still don't know exactly what that is. Um, I want to provide some examples of research, and every once in a while I have a couple of numbers in here. When I'm, when I'm usually giving a talk, it's to people who want to pick apart the numbers, but I don't want to scare you with the numbers. In every case, I'll sort of explain uh, what they mean. And the part I want to get to at the end is the strange fact that in Buddhism, the goal in English, at least, is called non-attachment. And uh, I went to one of these scientists meet with the Dalai Lama events in Dharamsala, India, a few years ago. And this is one of the conversations we had. And I think we straightened it out, at least to our satisfaction. And I'll try to explain uh, how I think the, the really, I think, what non-attachment means is what we mean by attachment security. Um, but there are probably some differences as well. Uh, the theory began with uh, John Bowlby. It's a, there's a picture of him later in his life. He was a British psychoanalyst. And I think I have this very high reverence for him. I met him a couple of times and corresponded with him. But just as I get older and see the three volume series of books that he wrote called Attachment and Loss, it's amazing to me how one person could do that. It just, it, he spanned huge literature, animal research, human research, community psychiatry, and things like that, and really uh, found, I think, the essence of a lot of work that people hadn't seen in quite the same way. And toward the end of his life, he published this book, A Secure Base, that is a very informal way of explaining how he thinks, as a therapist, the ideas in attachment theory and research apply to psychotherapy. Um, he was lucky, compared to Winnicott and uh, s several of the other British psychoanalysts of Bowlby's time, he was very fortunate to have Mary Ainsworth, who at the time had married an anthropologist who had to be in England for a year. She answered an ad in the newspaper that Bowlby placed for someone to help with research about attachment, and her dissertation had been about dependency. So she was thinking about children's uh, reliance on parents for support. And unlike the other psychoanalysts, she provided a research avenue uh, for the rest of psychology to take up. And boy has it, that the handbook of attachment John mentioned, I've read every comma, space, <laughs> reference, everything that through two editions. And it's just amazing how the thing has taken off because of Ainsworth's original research. She invented the famous strange situation procedure that allows us to assess the, the kind of attachment an infant, say a one-year-old infant, has to its mother, and now often in the studies are also father. Um, and this is, I, I showed you Ainsworth very uh, late in her life. This is her when she was first doing the strange situation uh, research. And in those days, all the, uh, what's now high color video was black and white. 16 millimeter something film. So these are from uh, her original study. And at the same time, as a lot of you know, uh, Harry Harlow was doing this uh, famous research about uh, infant monkeys and their attachment to either a real mother or to a cloth covered mother. And he did a, a, a set of experiments that is sort of the model for Ainsworth's research and its application. And in it, um, he had infants who had become emotionally attached to this cloth fake mother, mother monkey that you can see there in that picture. And he put them into a strange room about as big as this stage with a cootie toy, if you know what that is. It looks like a plastic insect. It's a children's toy that you can put together and pull apart. It has a long curly proboscis on it. And a, a young monkey seeing that thing is terrified. And, uh, Harlow filmed these experiments. It was on a Charles Collingwood TV show about science, you know, a billion years ago. And I still show the film clip in my class because um, what happens is the infant monkey is led into this room, sees this cootie toy, and if there is not a cloth mother there, 
it curls up on the floor and whines and squeals and never comes out of that frightened position. And if the cloth mother is there, it runs over, holds on to the mother, and then just grab, you see it physically relax, look at the cootie toy, hug, look at the cootie toy, and eventually creep out and touch it and then come back and then creep out and take it apart. <laughs> And it's just, it just a huge, huge difference. And this was sort of what Ainsworth was looking for. And the strange situation has several three-minute episodes. A stranger comes in, the mother goes out, and eventually toward the end of, of the eight three-minute sessions, the mother goes out and there's no one there with the infant, and then you see what happens when the mother returns. So these, the patterns of attachment she identified were in that situation. So the theory uh, distilled down to one slide. So this is Bowlby's three volumes in one slide. His idea was that humans and those uh, uh, our closely related primate species rely on what he called attachment figures, often the biological mother, but not always by any means, uh, rely on those figures for protection, support, and help with emotion regulation. And he, uh, one of his theoretical ideas came from primate ethology, and that is that there are some genetically based behavioral systems that he called motivational slash behavioral systems, one of which is the attachment system. But there are others. One of them is the caregiving system. He thought all of us are built to respond, especially to the uh, signals given off by an infant, somebody with a big head, little body, big eyes, crying, things like that. And that that's sort of the foundation of compassion and altruism, as I'll, I'll hope to show you in some of our studies. Ainsworth was interested in exploration. They realized that when, in the strange situation, when the mother's present, if she and the chick kid have a good relationship, the child is interested in the toys on the floor and explores them very creatively. When she leaves the room, that exploration system, as Bowlby called it, shuts down in place is the attachment system activated fully. And sometimes the kids will actually hang on the doorknob and lie by the crack under the door, uh, crying, things like that, after the mother has left the, the room. So their idea was that security of attachment is the foundation for being able to be caregiving and to be exploring and so on. And a lot of our studies are based on that fairly simple idea. And the notion, I, I'm saying it here now in words on the slide, the idea is that the attachment system is preeminent. If the person is insecure in the sense that they, they feel vulnerable and there's no protective figure, all of the other things that they might be doing motivationally take second place uh, compared to this desire for uh, the attachment figure. Ainsworth noticed, she identified three patterns of attachment in a strange situation originally called secure, anxious, and avoidant. And eventually one of her uh, grown-up graduate students, Mary Main at, at Berkeley, uh, figured out that in more troubled relationships, there's a fourth pattern that she called disorganized and disoriented. And those four patterns are the ones that have been studied extensively in, by developmental psychologists. And fortunately for me, uh, Bowlby had said in his books that the theory, even though it was focused on infants in the beginning, applies from the cradle to the grave. The third volume in the Attachment Law series is about grieving. And he viewed grief as what happens when this attachment figure is lost, either, either as gone away or died. Uh, and one of his original practical interests was that British hospitals at that time didn't let the parents stay with their young children when they were in the hospital and didn't let young children visit, for example, their mother when she was in the hospital. And as a result of this research program and his books, all of that changed. Uh, my 16 year, one of my 16-year-old twin daughters had heart surgery last week, and my wife slept all night on a blow-up mattress at the UCF, UCSF Medical Center in San Francisco. And th that kind of thing would not have been allowed at all when Bowlby uh, first started. So the idea, they didn't present a diagram like this in their um, book, but the idea of the theory was that when there's a stranger, a threat, a pain, fatigue, and things like that, we're built to ask, is there somebody that we could lean on? Is there someone to uh, help us during this situation? And if we perceive the answer to be yes, and of course the best original answer of yes is there really is someone, 
Then you see in the strange situation, the kid is playful, exploratory, more social, less afraid of a stranger, and so on. If the answer is perceived to be no, one of the things Ainsworth found out is that either uh, the box on the bottom left there, and I don't know how to turn my little laser pointer on, so I'm afraid to push any extra button. Um, one of the things that can happen is intensification of the effort to get the attention of, of this attachment figure. And the other thing that she noticed, sort of psychodynamically more interesting, I think, is that if that figure is not reliably responsive, in fact, maybe is more negative when the kid shows a need for this thing, the child can learn to have a defensive, suppressive barrier on this natural desire for closeness. And over time, this is what Ainsworth called avoidant attachment and anxious attachment respectively. Secure attachment would be generally being in that upper loop of this diagram. So the, the whole idea is there's a kind of built-in dynamic. The natural thing is for the child to rely on this reliable figure. If that figure isn't reliable for one of several well-researched reasons, the child is going to develop some kind of insecure way of dealing with that. And the child's initial adaptation to that major attachment figure colors their interactions with people in, in close relationships all the way uh, beyond that. And there are now 20, 30 year longitudinal studies showing that you can actually predict much later uh, issues, especially if you also take into account what happened along the way, divorce, a breakup, a new, a better attachment figure being found and things like that. Those change the, uh, the, the reaction to the original relationship. But you can see the traces of the original relationship all the way through uh, research up to age 30. In our research, because I am a personality social psychologist who usually studies captive young adult college students or uh, community adults, um, we turned Ainsworth's system. Originally, we had a questionnaire that said, in your romantic relationships, are you more like A, B, or C? And A, B, and C were descriptions for adolescents and adults of what Ainsworth had found in her infant research. And eventually, for various reasons I won't go into, personality people don't like typologies very much, we uh, created two continuous scales to measure avoidance in close relationships and anxiety about abandonment and rejection in close relationships. The two scales, the scores on them are fairly independent. And as a result of that, we could put people into categories that are like Ainsworth's categories, but in fact, in most of the research I'll show you, we just use their scores on those two dimensions uh, to, to characterize their attachment patterns in close relationships. And so on our two scales, this will become relevant for the studies I'm going to show you. Security means not being anxious or avoidant on those scales. The scales run from fairly secure ends to either anxiety or to avoidance. And then there are all these different kinds of insecurity. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the way I have to represent it there, it looks like there are more insecure people and secure people, but that's not true. Uh, it's just a, it's the, the, a characteristic of the way we have uh, named the scales and so on. Most people in most ordinary samples of college students or community adults are pretty secure on these scales, but a lot of people aren't. And the variation on the scales is what allows us to uh, find the things I'm going to tell you about. <coughs> Just so you know, I, I know from a lot of experience and from being a person myself that when I talk about this, everyone's going to be interested in what you are yourselves and what your relationship partners are and things like that. So these are some examples. There, we have two 18-item scales, and we have as many as 18 so that we can write them in the positive and negatively worded directions and have high internal consistency reliability, which is one standard for measurement in psychology. So here's avoidance. I prefer not to show a partner how I feel deep down. I try to avoid getting too close. A reverse scored item is I feel comfortable depending on relationship partners. The avoidant people do not feel comfortable with that. I turn to a relationship partner for many things, including comfort and reassurance, and they tend not to. On the anxiety scale, I don't often worry about being rejected or abandoned is a reverse uh, scored item. And then these are sort of the heart of the uh, matter. I need a lot of reassurance that I'm loved. I get frustrated if a relationship partner is not available when needed. In Ainsworth's strange situation, the baby she called anxious 
are very upset and crying when their mother leaves. But when she comes back, instead of being comforted and calming down the way the secure ones do, they throw a tantrum and kick and arch their back and things like that. And they're, they're angry that she left them and caused them to feel that uh, degree of upset. I resent it when a partner spends time away from me. That kind of orientation in an adult or adolescent relationship causes intrusive behavior, jealousy, and things like that that very often destroy the relationship and end up with the person having exactly the situation they were afraid uh, of, and that is being abandoned. In 1987, one of my graduate students, Cindy Hazan, and I published a paper in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology for the first time giving this conception of romantic relationships in attachment theory terms and providing that original three category measure and a lot of associated findings. And when we did that, um, I frankly thought this might be the end of my career because this was a psychoanalytic theory about babies and mothers applied to love and none of those were, uh, were in social psychology at that time. And to my surprise, it immediately uh, captured the attention of uh, other young researchers mostly. And uh, one of them was Mario Michelancer, my since, since then uh, partner in crime and research. Um, it, it took off and there are now thousands of studies. That study, uh, Cindy and I received an award in Austin, Texas a couple weeks ago for scientific influence. And the person who introduced us said that the article has been cited 4,400 times. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it was amazing. I mean, we, we did this by the seat of our pants or the tops of our heads, and it just immediately uh, captured researchers' attention. Um, Michelenser and I have a, a book uh, published in 2000 called Attachment in Adulthood, and in there we elaborate this Bowlby and Ainsworth model a little bit like this. We put signs of threat right in the model instead of sort of lurking outside it. Uh, the, the way I had it in that first flow chart. Because there, in this yellow uh, diagram I show, if a person is insecure and they either hyperactivate these attachment efforts, hyperactivating is the current name for this pattern of intense emotional striving, or they deactivate this natural system as much as they can at being avoidant, those things feed back into the rest of the process. The avoidant people try not to perceive things as threatening, sort of keep out of mind that, that they might need to rely on someone. And the anxious people are constantly thinking about whether they can rely on someone. And it, ampli it amplifies in the middle of the diagram there. Let me try pushing a button and see. Ah, in the, in the middle of the diagram, it amplifies this question of whether there's an attachment figure available. The avoidant people try not to think about that, and the anxious ones are constantly thinking about it. Uh, and a lot of their behaviors, we've, we've done uh, probably 150 studies, something ourselves, and other people have done hundreds more. That's very much at the heart of what's going on. The avoidant people try not to think about it or express it in behavior, and the anxious ones sort of having a hair trigger for worrying about abandonment and rejection. So in this bigger model, we still have the, the concept of avoidant attachment and anxious attachment. And the person's position on the scales I showed you predicts all kinds of things about the way they handle threats and the way they uh, look for or try not to look for someone to rely on. <clears throat> so what I'd like to try to describe uh, quickly today is Bowlby had the idea that underlying the persistence of these early patterns is some kind of cognitive affective structure that he called the internal working model. And he specifically talked about internal working models of self and of relationship partners. And his idea was after a lot of interactions, a, a, a child builds up a sense of if you're in trouble, the natural thing to do is rely on someone and you'll get help and then you'll be able to return to your other activities and interests. And the insecure uh, people are not being able to count on that. They don't have that model ingrained in themselves. And often, they have some combination of a negative model of self, that they're not lovable, or a negative model of other people as being unworthy of help, for example, unreliable, things like that. And I'll show you a lot of evidence of that. One of the things that we've been able to do because of modern research technology 
is that we can present threats, for example, to people unconsciously, subliminally, on a computer screen in the middle of another task that they think they're doing. And by doing that, we can see various things about what's active in their mind, how they react to threats, for example, of death, of injury, of illness, uh, of separation. Um, after doing a bunch of those negative priming studies, as we call them, we realized that probably you could do the same thing on the positive side. You could probably cause a person to feel more secure temporarily in an experiment. And if we could do that, we could see what are some of the uh, benefits of security in social behavior. And it turns out, to my amazement, frankly, we can do that and the people become more compassionate, more helpful, less racist, and things like that from this very brief uh, increase in a sense of, of security. Um, a lot of the research, because we started this in the relationship area, is about couple relationships, marriages, for example. And so there's a whole lot of research about sex in relationships and how it's related to the attachment patterns and support of partners in uh, close relationships, including marriage. And finally, I, I'm hoping to get to, as I said, this mystery sort of of attachment and non-attachment. Uh, non-attachment being a Buddhist concept. So I want to show, begin with showing you something about these internal working models. One of the ways that uh, psychoanalysts, starting with Freud, have tried to peer into uh, a person's unconscious mental processes and structures is through dreams. And so uh, Mario and I and one of his graduate students uh, did a study about dreams. And we had people keep dream diaries for a month on average, these young adults uh, remembered and, and wrote about 14 dreams over the 30 days. And we had those dreams coded by independent coders trained in um, something called the core relationship, core code conflictual relationship themes method that uh, was developed to code psychotherapy sessions and dreams, other kinds of narrative uh, processes. And we were interested in whether scores on the two scales I showed you predict anything about the typical contents of a person's dreams when they're averaged across several dreams. And what happens is the, the people who score high on attachment anxiety represent themselves, as the theory led us to expect they would, as anxious, weak, and helpless. And they more often portray other people as unloving or not loving enough, of being critical of them, you know, of not being there to support them and things like that. The uh, people who score high on the avoidance scale represent themselves as less responsive to others, less interested in others' welfare, more distant, uncooperative, unexpressive, and angry, cold and hostile. And I wanna show you uh, examples of these because those are very abstract sounding terms. Here's an example from a young woman who scored low on both the anxiety and avoidance scale, so we think of her as relatively secure. I was sitting in my elementary school library reading a book, which seemed very natural even though I haven't been there for years. I spoke with friends and teachers and the place was just as it used to be. The principal came in and started yelling at us saying we were barbaric children. At first I thought we might have been noisy and deserved this rebuke, but I told him that despite whatever bad behavior we engaged in, we didn't deserve such treatment and he'd overlooked my many good qualities. So this is an example of a positive model of self. And you'll see the, the positive model of self gives her the courage to be assertive, which is a, a big theme in uh, clinical psychology. Um, I felt that despite being a little girl, I had enough self-esteem to tell him he was wrong. So I got up and told him I was not a barbarian, and I came to the library to read books that I like. He then apologized. So this is, a, is part of the model of others that if you assert yourself in a reasonable way, if you're sort of protecting your good uh, self-image in a reasonable way, the other person will respond uh, favorably. Um, <clears throat> I felt proud of myself. At that instant, my mom appeared, hugged me, and said I was okay, and she was also proud of me. I don't know how my mom got there. <laughs> Here's an example of a, a guy uh, scoring high on attachment anxiety. I'm arguing with friends about who, teacher, who teaches a particular course. This argumentativeness and conflict is characteristic of anxious people. And I told you some of the reasons why. They're, they're not trusting the other person. 
They're worried about being uh, rejected, banned, disapproved of, and so on. I start running toward the city and I see a bank robbery in pr process. Suddenly I realize that I am the bank robber. I'm debating with myself, a lot of our studies now are about ambivalence, and this is characteristic of the anxious pattern. I'm debating with myself about whether I should break into the bank or not, and I decide I should. I get into the bank and yell, give me the money. The teller stoops down below the counter, gets the money, hands it to me, and I run away. While exiting the bank, I shoot three times in the air and then run down the street with a weapon wrapped in a quilt. While running, I suddenly think about what I've done and what a bad person I am. Here's the, uh, this characteristic negative model of self. Maybe I hit someone while shooting in the air. I'm debating with myself about whether to run, more ambivalence, and suddenly notice that the money has disappeared. And I think, why can't I do something right for once? I love this. Why can't I rob a bank <laughs> effectively? <laughs> I want to cry, and they do cry more than people who don't score higher on that anxiety scale. Suddenly the cops arrive and I say, take me, maybe it's for the best. I go to jail. No one cares about me anyhow. There's a very characteristic uh, theme in their dream. I feel really ashamed of what I did, and suddenly my dad appears and yells at me, how dare you do such a foolish thing? You deserve to go to jail. You're worthless. So I, of course, not every person has their parents in every dream, but in these two examples, I want to show you, in line with the theory, their feelings about themselves, their characteristics themselves, are very closely tied in uh, semantic memory to their parents having certain kinds of responses toward them. And th these people are 22 years old, now, so it's, it's hanging on uh, for a long time. It hurts, but I know that what he says is true. Here's an example. The avoidant dreams are stranger in, in a lot of ways. I told you I think it's partly because they're suppressing a, a lot of the underlying insecurity. Uh, so this is a woman. Uh, who scores high on the avoidance scale. My parents wanted me to go with them to my grandma's house, and a discussion ensued about whether it was worth going, and if she would or wouldn't have food for us. So here's an example, you know, who cares about grandma? If there's nothing in it for me, I don't want to go all the way to grandma's house. And, and I'll show you if I have time later on. In a lot of our studies, we find these people, scores on that avoidance scale cor correlate about minus 0.45 with any kind of compassion or kindness just in study after study. I said I didn't want to go, and I went into the backyard alone. There was a cat party going on, and many disgusting, filthy black cats were sitting in a circle facing out with their backs toward each other. Every cat screamed one at a time, and if the cat opposite to that one correctly identified the screamer, that cat won. I sat in the corner with my computer, and was afraid to move. I thought, why didn't they run away when they saw me? I realized that because there were so many of them, they knew they had power over me and could easily wipe me out. Here's a model of others, filthy black cats with their backs toward each other who could wipe you out. <clears throat> Suddenly my computer fell and landed close to the cats. I had to save it, so I got closer to them but when I did, they jumped on the computer and threatened me with aggressive expressions and horrible screams. They started to sing, if you don't go home, you'll have to tell us who is a nice cat. And I think this is you know, somewhat related to the, if you go to grandma's house, <laughs> you're going to have to be nice to her, which is a pain, and you might not even get food out of it. <clears throat> I had to answer with a song saying all of them were nice, and they then let me have my computer. I wanted to destroy them one by one, but instead I went inside with the computer and woke up in terror. And I'll show you experimentally, behind the avoidant defensive facade is all the insecurity the anxious people have, but it's usually suppressed and hidden. <clears throat> Another way of getting at this internal working models is through projective testing, another kind of uh, quasi-clinical method. Harriet Waters, who's a uh, child attachment researcher at Stony Brook, uh, did some studies showing that kids who have a secure relationship with their uh, primary parent, if you give them little cards from a story and ask them to put this together to make a coherent story, the more secure ones can create a story that says, this kid is in trouble, is going to seek help from an adult, 
and that's going to work well, and then they're going to return to playing or whatever. It's sort of the, the uh, Ainsworth flowchart that I showed you at the beginning in a little test. And what she found is the secure ones are much more likely to be able to put that whole story together in the secure way. So uh, Mario and I did some experiments like this with uh, college students, and we gave them something like TAT pictures that, to write about, and all of them presented in the beginning a person, say, in a hospital bed or a per person who looks unhappy, and some other people vaguely around, and then they write a, a narrative about this. And what happens is their scores on the anxiety and avoidance scales uh, correlate. Here's a place where I'm going to show you a number. Don't worry about the number. But the more anxious or avoidant they are, the less they have the full elements of the secure base script in their stories about these pictures. And in a second study, we looked more carefully at what's missing, what exactly goes on with those stories. And what happens is that anxious people's stories tend to say the person is suffering, the person is going to eagerly seek help, and then all kinds of things go on and they never get out of that interaction. Very much like the last step in a strange situation where instead of being okay and back to playing with the toys, there's still a, a battle of some kind going on with the attachment figure. Uh, the avoidant people wrote a different kind of story. It's like the person is in trouble and the person is going to get out of trouble, <laughs> do they? not relying on anyone else, even though there are these indications that there are other people potentially available to help. So these are just two ways of trying to explain to you many other kinds of studies getting at what these internal working models are like. And one of the ways is dreams, one of the ways is through these free uh, narratives. So you get a, a sense of what's underneath any particular behavioral manifestation you might see. Lately, because one of Mario's students who had been in the uh, Israeli military uh, was chastising us because we're always saying what's wrong with being anxious and avoidant. And he said, at least in this military uh, context, the anxious people are sensitive about threats, and they're actually very good detectors of threat. They can see something that might be threatening out in the distance in a way that's very useful to the other people. So we've studied this and called it a sentinel script. That it, it looks bad when it causes jealousy, intrusiveness, and everything in a close relationship, but it actually might pay off at the level of the group to have some people around who are like this. The avoidant ones are very quick to save themselves. And you could see that kind of selfishness in the dream I gave as an example. And as a result, in the real world and in experiments we've now done in the lab where we have a computer that looks like it's coming on fire, uh, it's done by pumping smoke through it from a party smoke machine out of the computer. And the computer has a lot of papers stacked uh, untidily on top of it. And so the natural thing to say, whoa, you know, we're, they're in a room where they think it's an, an industrial psychology experiment and they're a work group. And what happens is the anxious people detect faster that something's wrong with the computer and the avoidant ones are the first out the door. And by going out the door quickly, you know, which I think is a sign of, of selfishness, they actually model for everybody else the, the famous bystander intervention thing where everyone stands around, they don't act. Everyone acts when they see this person go out the door. So some of our papers recently are about the possibility that these uh, patterns are functional for groups, for c communities sometimes, even if they might cause trouble at the level of a close relationship. So I just want to, I don't want to say only bad things about those people who might save you in a hotel fire by <laughs> first smelling the smoke and then showing how to get out. Another issue uh, in the theory is that Bowlby thought when this baby, this one-year-old in a strange situation, detects that mother's leaving or strangers coming in, there's a kind of alerting to the, the need to hang on to the attachment figure. And that's studied behaviorally in infants because you can't, you can't study them verbally. They can't talk to you about what they're feeling. And a way that we work with this is to present threats, as I said, unconsciously with a 22,000th, sometimes 24,000th of a second blip on a computer screen. And amazingly, even though probably all of us heard in some previous psychology course that subliminal stimulation in movies doesn't do anything, it definitely does things. You can, you can study all kinds of cognitive effects and it actually was used first by cognitive psychologists. So what we wanted to do is 
unconsciously present threats, words like death, illness, failure, and separation, in the middle of another task and see what becomes active in people's minds when that threat is registering unconsciously. And the way we do this is with a lexical decision task where people just say some letters come on the screen and their job is to say whether this is a word or not. And cognitive psychologists had shown that if this, the concept named by that word is active unconsciously, they're quicker to see that it's a word if it's been activated by a previous stimulus. And what's interesting, especially interesting in relation to what cognitive psychologists have said, usually they would say putting in a positive prime is going to lead to a positive reaction, putting in a negative one is going to lead to negative associates. But what happens with this is that love-related words become more available in people's minds after this unconscious threat comes in. And the secure people, those scoring low on the two scales I showed you, generally activate only those positive words. It's actually contrary to a simple cognitive effect. A negative stimulus comes in and they activate a bunch of positive security uh, love kinds of words. Anxious people activate both positive and negative. So as soon as this threat comes in, they do the natural thing of thinking about being able to rely on someone else and then think of what's wrong, what's dangerous about that. And the avoidant people, interestingly, look like the secure ones. They activate the positive words and not the negative ones, unless we also have them remember a seven or nine digit number while they're doing all this other stuff, which uses up some frontal lobe executive capacities. And then, they, then the negative words are triggered. So it's, it's one kind of indication that they really are cognitively suppressing the negative side of, of insecurity and you can knock away their ability to do that experimentally. So both anx anxiety and avoidance, I think, are anchored in negative experiences with key relationship partners uh, earlier in life. And anxiety and avoidance are two different ways of, of dealing with the pain. This is an example, uh, a little bit artificial one, but I just want you to see what it means. It, the real X, the uh, focal point in the computer is much smaller than that, but I wanted you to be able to see. In the center of the screen, there's a place where we ask them to keep their attention focused. And at 22,000, 24 thousandths of a second, depending on the computer's refresh rate, a th threatening stimulus is presented like the word death. They don't see it. And then a bunch of letters appear on the screen, and they have to say whether that's a word or not. And the non-words, in some of our studies are scramblings of the real words, and sometimes they're just meaningless letters. The scrambling of the real ones has a problem that some people's brains are really quick to see the word in the scrambled one anyway, so that sort of reduces the difference between them. And the problem with just random letters is that they don't have the same visual properties, the same number of angles and curves and stuff on them. So we've used both methods and we get the same kind of results whether we use meaningless strings of letters or scrambled uh, real words. Um, more recently, um, Jeff Simpson and some of his uh, students, Becky's is the first author in this paper, published in Psychological Science, another kind of paper using this lexical decision method the way we did. And what they wanted to know, that attachment theory is basically saying you activate this desire for, for support from someone else when you're threatened. And that process of feeling threatened and then being comforted is what causes the emotional attachment to this attachment figure. So they stripped that process down to something really simple experimentally. They subliminally presented threatening stimuli, like a, a striking snake or a control uh, stimulus. And the person didn't see that consciously. They then show either a, a warm, welcoming, this is, I took this off the internet, so I haven't seen really what picture they used, but they said a Duchenne smile, which is Ekman's name for a real smile, sort of a supportive smile, or a neutral expression. And the subjects then did a lexical decision task where the words were things like security related words, safe, protect, secure, trust, warm, or insecurity words, alone, anxiety, threat, distress, rejection, despair, and needy. And what happens is that when they receive the threatening stimulus and this Duchenne smiling woman's face, 
they had, they reacted quickly to see that the positive words are positive. So it's another case where a negative, a, a threat, actually amplifies this good effect of the potential attachment figure's positive uh, reaction. And that, that's really interesting. I mean, it's like the core of, of, I think, what Bowlby's original idea was captured in a very brief uh, experiment. <clears throat> Another thing we did um, is that it, it should be the case that not just this threatening stimulus is activating love-related, security-related words, but it's activating your mental representation of your attachment figures. And it may not be doing that consciously. We're, we're trying to probe this very sensitively to see if they become more active. So we did that experiment again. Instead of the uh, words, we had the names of people that this subject said were the, who they rely on for support or other people that they know well, but they're not their attachment figures, basically, or just mere acquaintances, or in some of our studies, just neutral names that they say they don't know anyone well who has that name. And what happens is that when a negative unconscious uh, threat comes in, the names of their attachment figures are mentally available faster, suggesting that unconsciously, you know, very automatically, feeling threatened at, at some very low level automatically activates a network of love re support related stuff and the people who could provide that. And the one, one of the things that happens in this kind of study is the more anxious people have the names of their attachment figures super readily available all the time, whether we threaten them or not. And the avoidant ones with certain uh, threatening words like the word separation, it actually takes them longer to notice that their mother's name, for example, is a word, that their husband's name is a word. So something about this issue of difficult separation or rejection seemed to be an issue for the avoidant people, but it's pretty complicated. They, they often look secure if you don't do something to sort of look more carefully at, at the details. And the final thing, probably in this uh, setting, I should say more about this. We've published two or three papers recently about God and religion and attachment. But basically, in this kind of uh, subliminal threat followed by available constructs for people who are religious, God, Jesus, the Virgin Mary, Buddha, these kinds of figures become available just the way their human uh, living attachment figures do. And I think that's really important. We, we've written a lot about different issues within religion because these individual differences I'm talking about affect how religion is perceived, how it's used by the person, and so on. But basically, I, I think of God functioning very much like an attachment figure. And if you read uh, any kind of religious passages and hymns and things like that, you'll see how much it's about that, that I'm suffering, I need somebody to take care of me, and somebody who has a firm representation of being taken care of that way, it actually functions like a, a uh, living, breathing attachment figure. <clears throat> okay, another issue in the theory is emotion regulation. I said, because emotion regulation and self-regulation executive functions in the frontal lobes and everything are a big deal all through psychology right now, uh, Bowlby had said part of what the good attachment figure is doing is not just comforting the child, but usually talking to them about how to uh, understand troubling things that are happening to them. And so they're, they're simultaneously lowering, lowering the, I'm thinking of a kid now, lowering the kid's stress level, the threat level, but at the same time teaching them some effective ways of dealing, coping with negative experiences, which of course everyone is, is going to have. And so we've done a whole lot of studies about this and so have other people. And uh, avoidance is especially interesting to me because I said it seems like it's defensive and it's sort of more complicated cognitively than anxiety. Uh, anxiety is just sort of like a hyper version of the natural uh, reaction. So I want to give you a couple examples about avoidance. This is maybe hard to explain. Another, besides a lexical decision task, another common task these days is called a Stroop color word task. And what it is, a word appears on the screen. In the original one done by a guy named Stroop in the 1930s, the word blue, say, would appear, and it's printed in green. And the job of the subject when this word comes on is to say what color it's printed in, not say what the word itself means, which is another color. And when you do this, I, I did my first undergraduate 
study uh, this. And in those days, we used a stopwatch and big printed cards. Now the whole thing is done with computer uh, presentation, one word at a time. So I saw the people doing it out loud, reading. And what happens at first is, you know, and you, you see a huge strain on them of doing that. Well, it turns out that that's happening because both the, re the, the word that's being read and the color that they're supposed to name are conflicting in them. And it takes some work to push down one of these, do the others. Well, it turns out that you can do that task and any word that is momentarily activated in their uh, memory, it takes them longer to say what color it's printed in. Because the, the, the meaning of the word is, is very active in their mind and it takes more work to get that out of the way to say what the color is. So this is called an emotional uh, Stroop test. So people had, uh, uh, Dan Wegner at Harvard had published a book that was about studies based on don't think about a white bear. And what he showed is that if you're trying to follow instruction of don't think a white bear, you're actually constantly activating your white bear node in memory because you have to remember what you're not supposed to be thinking of. And you're doing it part, almost unconsciously, not quite unconsciously. So what he showed is that there's a rebound of massive thinking about the white bear once the instruction to not think about it is gone as a kind of residue of this whole thing having been active. So we did a bunch of studies prior to the one I'm going to describe here where we asked people to think about a painful relationship breakup. And then we came and we were measuring their skin conductance uh, in the case of autonomic arousal. And we then came in and said, okay, we want you to quit thinking about the painful breakup and we're going to have you do something else. And the higher their score on the attachment anxiety scale is, the longer their skin conductance level remains high even after we tell them not to think about it. And the avoidant people were especially good. Their skin conductance actually dropped when we said stop thinking about it as if they know how to do this. They could uh, make this stop. So uh, the first couple of papers I uh, published about this with Chris Fraley, who was one of my graduate students then, we were sort of saying, wow, these avoidant people are fine. They can do this. And maybe this is good for them. You know, they can not think about something that's painful. And Mario, my Israeli research uh, partner, said he, he knew that that isn't really the whole story because when they had Scud missile attacks on Tel Aviv or when a Jewish person has to go to the board of rabbis to ask about a divorce, things that are highly threatening, the avoidant people try to act like it isn't bothering them. But then within a month or two, they have more psychosomatic illness symptoms and things like that. So his idea was they're doing work to shut this down. And in some cases, that may be covering something that's harmful that can break through if they have uh, stressful experiences. So this is what it's hard for me to explain. But basically, what I want to show you here is that when we ask them to suppress thinking about the painful breakup, after we say now it's OK to think about it, the ones who are not avoidant show this Wegener rebound effect. Uh, so they can try to hold it down and then it pops up. The avoidant ones don't. Even after they've suppressed it, they don't show a rebound. But if we ask them to remember a seven or nine digit number uh, during the task, what happens is that yellow line moves up to the red one and it does it even in the control condition. So it suggests that the avoidant people are suppressing the painful breakup all the time. And they can do it uh, with, with you know, no obvious cost to them. But it is costing them something cognitively. If you interfere with their executive functions, the whole thing pops up uh, again. So that's an experimental way of, of showing the breakdown. Another interesting thing is we had, a month before the experiment, we'd asked people to list their positive traits and to list their negative traits. And what we found is that while the avoidant people are not thinking about the painful breakup, even in this sort of automatic Stroop test, um, what they are, what they do have active is their own positive traits. And so it seems like part of the way they're carrying out their suppression normally is a kind of ego boosting. Uh, in, in some cases, I don't want to uh, conflate it with narcissism, but something like that, that there are, we have another other indication that part of the avoidance thing is to suppress this, denigrate other people, and build up the self. But when they are uh, having to deal with remembering this long number, 
the thing that becomes, not only do the loss, the breakup words become available automatically, but so do their negative traits. And this suggests that, there, that there's a memory network of what's wrong with them and the fact that they've been rejected and things like that. And all of it is sort of a network that's being held down uh, normally defensively. In a more, I'll jump over this quickly so I, I don't uh, take too much time, but in a more real world study, one of uh, Mario's graduate students, uh, Eddie Barrett, who's now a clinical psychology professor in Israel, her husband is a uh, pediatric cardiologist. And so he was interested in the fact that when a child is born with a congenital heart defect, it puts a pretty big burden, an unexpected one, a sad one, on the uh, parents. And he'd just seen in his practice that some parents deal with this very well and sort of help him, help them uh, have as uh, good a life as they can under those conditions, and others don't do so well. So he uh, did us the favor of measuring anxiety and avoidance using the Hebrew version of the scale items I showed you. When, uh, on the mother, when the kid was born with a congenital heart defect, and he also rated, uh, just part of normal medical procedures, rated how serious this heart problem was and was going to be. And so we followed these people over seven or eight years and wanted to see, do their attachment scores at the time that kid is born predict anything about what happens after that? And I said, I'm going to go over it quickly. It's pretty complicated, but it's a published study. You could look up if you like. Um, what happens is over time, the more avoidant the women were, the more their own mental health deteriorates and the more their marriage deteriorates. And by age seven and eight, the measures that we took on that child, now seven and eight, show the effects of the mother's anxiety and especially avoidance when the child was born. So we think of this as kind of like the, the uh, remembering the seven or nine digit number is called a cognitive load. This is sort of like a cognitive and emotional load. It's something that has to be dealt with either openly, directly seeking other people's help and things like that, or denied, reacted negatively to, and so on. And over time, that hurts the person who's doing it, and it hurts uh, their children. By the way, the ones who are not avoided or anxious, the, the severity of the kid's heart defect had no effect on them or their marriage that was measurable uh, in that study. So it, it means it didn't have to happen. It, it really was something about them uh, from the beginning. So. I, I mentioned in a lot of our studies, the anxious people show this hyper sensitivity to loss, rejection, inadequate affection, and so on. And so this is one of the areas where we used neuroimaging to try to see what's under the uh, self-report kind of findings that we got. And there are a lot of other studies like this now, but I, I just want to show you one to tell you this kind of thing exists. So we had people in this fMRI scanner and we had them, you can project things on a screen that they can see above them. It's projected onto a mirror and they're looking at the mirror. And so you can do these experiments that I've been describing while the person having the brain scan. And when you do that uh, with the painful breakup, think about the painful breakup, the correlation between the self-report attachment anxiety scale and some areas uh, related to anxiety and uh, emotion memory are activated and the correlations are in this range points. 1.0 is a perfect correlation. To me, this was amazing that with all the possible error, response bias, and everything in the self-report measure, you can see fairly directly the connection between what they're saying they experience and what's going on in their brain. And negatively related to that anatomically are the frontal areas that when we say don't think about it, Somewhere up here is where, th where the command to not think about it is coming. And here's the correlation between their self-reported attachment anxiety score and how active those areas are when we tell them not to think about it. The more anxious they are, the less they are able to activate the areas that would keep the emotion reaction from going on. So th I think the self-report of I'm really emotional about these things and I can't control it which we've been studying all the time more at this conscious level, is actually visible in their brain activation, uh, surprisingly. I mean, it, it, it 
one of many things about all this that is amazing to me. There are other uh, interesting studies that using uh, neuroscience method now. Jim Cohen at the University of Virginia, a very creative guy who worked with John Gottman, a famous marital researcher, as an undergraduate, then became a neuroscientist and worked with Richie Davidson, who is uh, one of the top uh, people in, in uh, emotional neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin. So Jim did a fairly simple study where he had women in the first version of the study in the scanner, and they were in a common sh electric shock paradigm where a signal would come on telling them that they're like a 30% sh chance they're going to get an electric shock, and 30% of the time they do. So when that, they become classically conditioned to this signal like a tone that's indicating they might get shocked. And you can see in the fMRI scan all the aspects of the stress response in their brain occurring. So the reason for doing this is he had them either in, in that condition and no one held their hand, or a, a research guy, a, a stranger to them except for just meeting them before this, held their hand, or their spouse held their hand. And what happens is that when anyone holds their hand, at least of the nice guys who are in that study, their stress response in the brain goes down. And when their partner holds their hand, it goes down more than that. And how far it goes down with a partner is significantly related to the quality of their relationship measured with a self-report scale. So this is a kind of uh, another way, I mean, Cohn's thinking of this as an attachment related process. He just wants to see if it's really affecting stress reactions in the brain, and it definitely is. He's done it now with gay couples as well, the same results. And recently, the, the person in the marital therapy area that's, that's taken up our research the most actively is Sue Johnson. And this is how uh, John and I met last year at a Sue Johnson fest in uh, Holland with a bunch of marital therapists. Um, she and, and Jim have been working now to see if her kind of attachment-oriented couples therapy uh, improves the relationship in this sense that it has a bigger stress reduction effect on the spouse who's in the scanner, and it does. Uh, so it's, a, it's one of many indications now that you could do interventions related to the ideas and, and they would be effective. Another uh, really creative person, Naomi Eisenberger at U, uh, UCLA, I just wrote an evaluation recommending her for tenure, so I assume she's any day now is going to be associate professor at Naomi. Um, she's done some studies in the scanner showing just pictures of the person's partner or somebody else. And the somebody else is somebody else in the study's partner. So they're all partners, but only one of them is the person's actual partner. And she thought even seeing that person's face in a slightly stressful situation lowers the stress reaction in, in the brain. So the kind of thing that Bovey and Ainsworth were talking, Ains were talking about in parent-child relationships is there in couple relationships and it's there in the brain, not just in, uh, in the kind of methods that we were usually using. So I mentioned earlier that after doing a bunch of these unconscious threatening uh, studies, we realized maybe you could do the same thing on the positive side, that you could uh, do something to activate whatever degree of security capacity the person has and then that might affect how they feel and, and the behaviors they engage in. And, um, you know, everyone knows that positive feelings are, are beneficial in a lot of ways to uh, people. And unlike uh, Ainsworth studies where everything was behavioral, including that the mother had to be there physically, what we've seen is that um, in adults, you don't actually have to have the person there. I've already said you could have a picture of them there. And the same goes for the religious studies. You can call to mind a, a kind Jesus, a helpful Virgin I was raised as a Catholic, by the way, so that's why I have those Christian Catholic. The, the Virgin Mary, I think, was my mother's key heroine. Um, you can do this with your partner, too. You can imagine being comforted by, by someone you care about, by your parents, if you had a good relationship with your parents. And that has all of these good effects that I was talking about. So we realized we could probably activate some of those kinds of processes in experiments. And we've done a lot of kinds of security uh, priming manipulations now. One way to do it 
is by presenting pictures or words that have this suggestion of love, support, affection, kindness, things like that. Another is, I've already told you, we can do things with the names of the individual's security providers. And uh, unconscious presentation of those or a conscious vi guided imagery of someone that they care about who cares about them, thinking of that person comforting them, all of those kinds of manipulations tend to have measurable beneficial effects. Uh, visualizing their faces. Naomi used their actual faces, but you can ask a person to think of that kind person's face, and it has various beneficial effects. So we've done a bunch of studies and found that that kind of security priming procedure, even when done unconsciously, uh, activates positive emotions in a person, and it does it more than other kinds of positive words like money, success, or humor. So it isn't just positive, this is one of the mysteries to me, it isn't just positive affect, it's something about being loved and supported that has these special qualities that make the person uh, feel better. Um, we've seen with the, there's something called the PANAS, the positive and, and negative affect scales that measure affect using a lot of adjective uh, emotion words. And positive affect goes up uh, using that kind of measure. Another thing is that that positive reaction from security priming will be, can be applied to something else. So my advisor in graduate school, Bob Zients, had done studies where he used Chinese characters or fake Turkish words as stimuli that most of his subjects at that time, at UC Davis, this wouldn't work anymore because a third of the students are Asian. Uh, but at the time, these were sort of meaningless, complex stimuli. And it turns out that unconscious security primes cause people to perceive that this Chinese character means something more positive. So the positivity in them bleeds off onto other uh, stimuli. And Mario's done some studies where he made it harder to do this because it was sort of a negative spin on things and it overcame the negativity and still resulted in a positive spread. I'll show you that in a, in a couple relationship if I have time at the end. Uh, so, it affects positive affect. Happiness is one of our uh, themes here, and this is one of the sources of uh, positive affect. Another thing that I want to mention quickly, we did eight experiments to look at the concept of authenticity, because part of the attachment literature that I'm not talking very much about here suggests that security goes along with a kind of confident honesty about what's inside you about your feelings, you're sort of being openly in touch without the defenses I've been talking about, and that it, it involves uh, compassionate attention toward another person. And originally Ainsworth was interested in that in the mother-child relationship, but it's true in any kind of uh, relationship. So we did a, a lot of studies at first just seeing if the current measures of authenticity go with attachment security, and they do. And then we did various experiments where we uh, used security priming, and the people became less likely to lie, less likely to cheat, more able to talk about their own difficulties and things like that. Um, so again, a fairly simple uh, manipulation of, of networks related to security allows the person to, to be more honest and, and authentic. Something I think I'm sure will be studied a lot more uh, once everybody uh, digests that paper. Um, another thing we did is at first look in a correlational way, do these measures relate to community volunteering, to ki kinds of compassion and kindness, and they do. I told you avoidance is a negative predictor of every kind of uh, benefiting others. And so, we wanted to do an experiment about this where the person had to cross a fairly big barrier to help somebody, uh, risking discomfort to themselves. And the way we did it is film a, a woman, a graduate student at UC Davis, who is from Israel and speaks both English and Hebrew well. And we did the, the study in Israel and in my lab in the United States. And the film was showing her going through a series of increasingly difficult, stressful tasks starting with looking at uh, grisly accident photos, and uh, some way halfway along, putting her arm in an ice bucket and holding it in as long as she could, which was very painful. And eventually it comes to 
picking up a live tarantula from a glass aquarium on a table. And she, as an actress, showed increasing discomfort with these things. And eventually, at the tarantula uh, point, she just couldn't do it. So we, this, we had real subjects and her. And they thought, the subjects thought that each of them was in a separate room. Both of them were hooked up to skin conductance uh, devices. And we told the real subjects that the other subject is going to go through a bunch of difficult tasks. And we're just interested in their autonomic arousal of them and of you watching them. And they thought that the rooms were connected by this video thing. So they were actually looking at a video of her, but they thought that she was really there. And what we wanted to do is see whether, as she becomes uncomfortable, they become more sympathetic, more compassionate toward her. And then the final step would be, will they take her place and pick up the tarantula? So we measured their self-reported compassion, how distressing they just found this person, how emotional they felt uh, watching what's going on with her. A kind of easy task, might they be willing to help? And then the final step is, she seemed really stressed out and everything. What about you take her place and she'll come over here and you'll go through. The next task, by the way, they knew was to put their arm in a box of cockroaches that would run up their arm. <laughs> yeah, so we had these pre-scaled by students, you know, which would be the worst? That was the worst. So what happens is that unconscious or conscious security priming increased their feelings of compassion significantly. It doesn't look like a huge amount, but it's a significant difference on scale. It affected their self-reported willingness potentially to help her. And it very much affected whether they were willing to take her place. And the only thing was this, in the case of the unconscious thing, was just this simple unconscious security priming procedure. So this is related to Ainsworth's original idea that activation of attachment sort of in protecting yourself um, is at the expense of being able to pay attention to and uh, help someone else. One thing I want to mention because I've been emphasizing the experimental effects is that in all of these studies we get that experimental effect sort of without interacting with the individual differences. In other words, it has a beneficial effect on average on everyone, but there still is there are still individual differences, despite that experimental manipulation. And so here, what I want to show you is that the higher on the anxious attachment scale, the more they're upset watching somebody suffer. But it doesn't translate into compassion. It's just like, you know, it, you can imagine, it's like, whoa, I don't want to look, <laughs> look at her getting upset about picking up the tarantula. But it isn't, she's upset and maybe I could help her. And the avoidant ones are, significantly less compassionate toward her, less willing to help at the first step, less willing actually to take her place, which goes along with all the other kinds of, uh, uh, of effects where we have avoidance sort of counting against compassion and kindness. Um, another example of this, I'll go over real uh, quickly because I want to leave time for Buddhism. We wanted to do an experimental version of aggression. We'd already found in five experiments that security priming caused Israelis to be more sympathetic to uh, Israeli-Palestinian students applying to their college and things like that. I won't go into the details, but basically we saw, and, not, and there's another case where not only does that happen, that security increases openness to uh, a, a probably troubling other as far as these Israelis are concerned, um, but we even had uh, in the later experiments after we saw that this worked, we thought, what if the Palestinian says a few negative things about these Jews in their application to the college? It also overcame that. And sometimes the measure was, would they take this person around campus, show them the campus in a nice way, and things like that. So anyway, we knew about uh, all those kinds of things. So we wanted to do something, a, a more laboratory-oriented uh, example of sort of mild aggression. And other social psychologists had used a hot sauce method to do this where they taste some very hot spicy sauce and they find out that this other person in the experiment hates spicy stuff and can't stand it. And so 
they think their job is to give some hot sauce to this person, they're going to have to take it as part of this experiment. So it's a way of finding out how much pain would you want to inflict on somebody else in a, in a fairly stripped down uh, situation. And the first thing is, we had two kinds of others in this thing, a Jewish confederate, so someone who's like the, the students, and an Arab confederate. And what you see here is that the amount of hot sauce that they administer to the other person is significantly related to insecurity. And this goes along with everything we found about these kind of uh, uh, social uh, cruelty kindness things. And when we use security induction, it wipes out that effect. So even though they're inclined uh, to do this, feeling more secure makes them less inclined to uh, hurt this uh, other person. Another example, because I knew a lot of you would be in the clinical field, has to do with reactions to trauma and whether increased security might be beneficial in various kinds of clinical treatment processes. So we uh, conducted a study in Israel where we measured um, explicit and implicit reactions to terrorist uh, strikes in Israel. And we gave people a kind of PTSD, these are university students in Israel, so they're not real serious PTSD uh, victims, but there's a, a questionnaire for PTSD reactions to uh, terrorism, and we took the top people in the 75th percentile or above, people in the 20th percentile or above, so the high ones have a lot of symptoms for a, a neutral or a healthy group like that. The lower ones have uh, less kinds of reactions to it. And we brought them into the lab and gave them a Stroop color word test of the kind I've already tried to describe for you. In this case, certain words like Hamas, bomb, gunfire, stuff, all of it done in Hebrew, um, were printed in colors and they had to say what color it's printed in. So we can see how reactive they are to those uh, concepts. And they either receive security primes, a Hebrew word for being loved, or a neutral word hat, or a positive, we always have to have these other positive affect words to show it isn't just positivity. So the word was a Hebrew word for success. And one of the things that's interesting is the kind of PTSD-like symptoms that the students have are related to their anxiety and avoidance scores in ways that you'd expect. The anxious ones have more of these flashbacks, intrusive arousal symptoms, and the avoidant ones realize that they're working hard not to think about uh, what's traumatic. And here's what I want to show you, that in the color naming test, when they got, had either a neutral subliminal stimulus or the word success or the word love, the non-PTSD people don't show reactivity to those terrorism words. The high PTSD symptom people in the beginning show it with these two kinds of primes, and when they've received this security prime, being loved, their reactivity to, the, uh, to those terrorism words goes down. And it goes down so there's no significant difference between them and the low uh, symptom group. So it's just a, it, it's not a hard test because they aren't really uh, severely traumatized, but it shows potentially the role of security in symptom reduction. Another study I'll describe even faster um, we wanted to see, because we've been working on this, don't think about hurt feelings, think about hurt feelings and so on, we did an experiment to see if there are differences, first of all, in reactions to hurt feeling episodes of anxious and avoidant secure people, and whether security priming would reduce the insecure people's reactions uh, as part of hurt feelings. And so I'm going to skip to the end and just tell you in words what happened. Um, we do get differences that the anxious people have more extreme reactions to these episodes of hurt feelings. The avoidant ones try to suppress it. But if they've received the subliminal security priming, the anxious ones show a reduction of the anxiety reaction and the avoidant ones become more able to cry to express negativity. I told you in the beginning, the questionnaire said they don't like to say what's inside them. But if you can get them to feel more secure, it's easier to get them to acknowledge the hurt feelings. Um, our original paper was saying that you'd probably need three of Bowlby's behavioral systems to talk about couple relationships. 
uh, adding attachment, caregiving, and sex, because unlike the mother-infant relationship that Bowlby and Ainsworth studied, in a couple relationship, both of you are attachment figures for each other and so on, and sex is involved. So again, I'm going to skip over it quickly so I have uh, time to talk about Buddhism. But what happens is that um, attachment anx anxiety and avoidance are related to sexual motives. And a number of studies now show that the anxious people sometimes use sex as a way of trying to hold the person in the relationship or get the pull the person into a relationship. As a result, they sometimes make bad decisions about that. They have more uh, sexually transmitted diseases. They have more unwanted pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies and things like that. So basically what I want to say about them is that in their search for affection and security, they're often using sex as a vehicle. They, by the way, have more cosmetic surgery and other kinds of things showing that to be attractive in these things, they'll do certain things because they don't think they're lovable enough in their natural state. Uh, the avoidant people in longitudinal studies, they often get involved in sex later during adolescence or early adulthood, suggesting that the idea of taking your clothes off and being that close to someone uh, is questionable to them in the beginning. But once they begin having sex, they have more partners, one more one night stand relationships, more kinds of things where it's just about sex and not about kindness or intimacy psychologically with the other person. And there's a whole big literature about that. We also found out in a study of couple relationships in Canada that avoidant attachment is related to not being sexually intimate in their primary relationship, sort of backing away from it once they're closely involved with this other person. And for women, at least, it, avoidance related to fewer sexual fantasies about their partners. It just seemed like another way of not, uh, not stepping mentally uh, toward being close with the other person. Anxiety uh, showed all these kinds of effects. I've already mentioned sort of a strong desire for sex as a sign of fidelity and closeness. And especially with the males in this study, um, it sometimes led to them being pushy about sex, demanding sex and things like that, that obviously can uh, cause conflict in the relationship. Uh, Greet Birnbaum, who was one of uh, Mario's former students and now a faculty member at his uh, university in Israel, has done a lot of the work about sexuality and attachment. She had people keep diaries about sexual fantasies. And to make a long study short, found that avoidant attachment is related to sexual fantasies that emphasize non-intimacy, control, wanting to be in control of the sexual interaction, negative views of their fantasy sexual partners. And anxious attachment related to sexual fantasies that emphasize desire for closeness, perception of the self as weak and dependent, and perception of fantasy sexual partners as cruel and abusive. This is sort of the extreme of not loving uh, enough. So as with the DREAM study and the TAT study and things like that, these insecure patterns are related uh, to sexuality in various uh, ways that are, uh, I think, theoretically understandable. Ah, there we go. Um, we've done a number of studies about anxiety avoidance and caregiving in a couple relationship. And I'm going to try to jump to our current ongoing uh, project. We have one paper in press about this now. We um, brought couples into the lab and randomly decided that one of them would be assigned the role of care seeker in the sense of talking about a problem and the other is randomly assigned to be a caregiver in that experimental setting. And the care seeker uh, met with one of my research assistants and was mapping out the problem she wanted to talk about. It couldn't be one about the partner. It couldn't be about the relationship. So it's often about uh, money, school, work, uh, relationship with their parents, and things like that. The caregiver uh, went through an experimental procedure that had two aspects. One of them was depleting them cognitively, which has been shown and we know from real life makes it harder for you to be a good caregiver. And we did it by giving them the, the original Stroop test. So they're repeatedly having to uh, name the color a word is printed in when the word itself is another color. 
And this is something that gives you a slight headache. It makes you tense in the neck and things like that. And it's been shown to cause uh, something being studied a lot now is cognitive depletion. The other aspect of it was either security priming subliminally or not. So we have this uh, depleted or not. In the not depletion, the words blue, green, and everything, the tests were the same except the ink color and the word were the same. So there's no strain at all in taking the test. But they went through a procedure that was similar. And what we wanted to know is what happens to this caregiver's supportive behavior in an interaction with their partner about the partner's problem. And we video recorded that 10 minute interaction and then had it coded. So that's what the next slides are saying. I'm going to skip over them because I've already explained it. Um, what happens is that if they receive a neutral prime rather than the security primes, the depleting Stroop task makes them less good caregivers. They're less sensitive. They're less attending. They're less listening and helping, a little more likely to criticize or not sympathize. And if they receive this subliminal security priming while they're doing either that neutral Stroop task or the difficult one, it wipes out that effect. They're better care. Again, this amazed me because we're doing something very simple and at the same time it's affecting observable behavior that can be coded from these video uh, reactions. And the people know they're being video recorded and everything, so it's not really a natural uh, situation. And this is both, we did this in Israel and we did it in my lab, very similar procedures. These are the American results, just like I uh, showed you. These are the Israeli results, the same pattern. So it's something, you know, it's not unique to couples in Davis, California. Uh, it's, it's probably something that can be found anywhere. So here, just to, an aside, something I would like to understand is how this works. You know, when, when you come home and you've had a stressful day, what's the mental process that lets you be attentive to your children or your partner, even though you've had that bad day, your neck may be stiff and you might have a slight headache. And I don't know whether to think that the, the person who's secure experiences all of that bad stuff and can set it aside mentally and, f and focus on the other person's needs, or whether the strain was not as great in the first place as a result of the security in inducing stimuli coming in. So it just, uh, I, I must say that when I've been thinking about this myself, I think it is that you have the, the power to set it aside. When, when I come out, I think it's possible to be kind, maybe even more kind in a way if you sort of, in a way, are sharing the suffering. That the other person needs you. You know what it's like to be in a tough situation. You've been worn down a little bit. I, I think it's, it's partly like that. I'm saying that probably because of the emphasis in later talks maybe about attention. <clears throat> this is another one where Despite the effects of the manipulation, the individual differences are still significant too. So I, I don't want you to think that we can do something in 15 minutes that erases the individual differences. It doesn't. It, it contributes positively, um, and it does that on average across all those different kinds of people, but it doesn't get rid of the individual differences. That would take a lot more therapeutic work. Um, there are a lot of other kinds of studies in the literature, and I used to have a tiny, <laughs> huge list of these, but I uh, realized that's crazy. But I want to just mention that if you factor analyze self-report measures of personality disorders, and we've done it with more than one, and you put the attachment measures in that same thing, there are two basic underlying dimensions of the personality disorders that line up pretty well with these two kinds of attachment insecurity. So I'm sure it's no surprise to clinicians, but I, I think it suggests that the issues I'm talking about underlie some fairly serious uh, problems. It's not the only kind of problem. It doesn't deal with the, the possible uh, brain, genetic, et cetera, contribution to some of those other things, but I think it's really part of the story. And speaking of genetic contributions, we've started doing gene studies because there were a couple of twin studies suggesting that our measures are more closely related for identical than non-identical twins, suggesting a, a possible genetic aspect. Attachment researchers have generally not wanted to have that story in there because the whole theory really is about being better parents, about being better uh, partners, better people, and things like that. 
But in our uh, exploration of this, we've already found a couple of candidate genes, one each related to each of the patterns. So I think that there, in no way does it explain anything like all the variants. It doesn't explain a big part of the variants, but a significant part of at least the where we're measuring these things is probably related to genetic uh, propensities. The disorganized, disoriented attachment pattern in infancy that I said Mary Main discovered and sort of delineated, it turns out that when people go back into longitudinal attachment studies and rescore the strain situations, including that troubled category, it turns out that category is the most predictive of anxiety disorders and dissociative disorders by adolescence. So um, at first, the attachment people wanted to say that came about because of the way the mother behaves. And, and Ames, Ames, or Maine was able to show some of the ways. She said the mother went in the reunion episode is frightening or frightened. And that causes the kid to do a bunch of weird behavioral things that she called disorganized. Um, some Europeans published a study showing there's a genetic contribution to that disorganized pattern. And at first, Marinus van Eisendorn, a Dutch researcher, one of the best uh, attachment researchers in the world, published a paper saying he had a bigger sample size than they did, and it wasn't true. And subsequently, I, I haven't, uh, John and I uh, were with him on a panel when we were in Amsterdam last year. I didn't ask him about this. But subsequently, he looked at the interaction, the statistical interaction of the mother's behavior and the gene, and it was like then six or more times as likely that the kid would show this disoriented pattern. So my guess is that there's going to be a genetic contribution, maybe a bigger genetic contribution to that most troubled pattern. Um, but in no way does I, I think that does away with the social effects the theory was originally about. And there are a lot of interventions now, both at the parent-infant level and in marital couples, as I mentioned, and they show good effects. So it's not something that's frozen in the genes in some way that can't be therapeutically uh, altered. Another kind of study we've done is about leadership. And because Mario had access to the uh, Israeli military, they're very, they're very research oriented, we did some studies there showing that avoidant leaders, um, th their avoidance predicts the mental breakdown of their soldiers during combat training. And we studied it over a several month period at long combat training. And the insecure soldiers are the first to show these mental health deterioration as a result of leader avoidance. But eventually, even the secure ones show uh, aspects of it. So this has launched a whole research area in organizational psychology and everything looking at leadership patterns as a function of security. And I think it's another area where there'll be a lot of uh, interesting findings. Another thing I want to make sure I say is that scores on the scales that I've talked about change as a result of relationship experiences. Traumatic relationship experiences can increase insecurity. And having a good partner, something we've actually measured, if you have a good caregiver in the very early stages of a relationship, that good caregiving predicts decreases in anxiety and avoidance over time in the relationship. So, when my students say, now, how do I pick that partner? I say, pick a secure person. Because <laughs> what, whatever you are, that, that angel is going to help you move in a good direction. And uh, I think it, it's, it's really important. And I assume the whole same thing goes with therapist-client relationships. And there's a bunch of emerging research about that. Uh, the other thing is that all of our priming studies in the beginning were in these very short term. The experiments usually took only a half hour or something like that. Now people are starting to do repeated priming over days or weeks, and it looks like it has an extended positive effect. So it's another sign that increasing the person's sense of security in, in various ways might have a long-term beneficial effect. OK, Buddhism. So it happened that because uh, Mario and I had done these studies about compassion being increased as a function of increased security, I somehow fell into the Buddhist network of psychologists with, with no prior training or anything for that. And I was invited to go to one of these uh, meetings where scientists meet with the Dalai Lama for a week in Dharamsal, India. This is a picture of the Tibetan Culture Center uh, there. And this is in a, a little lecture hall that's across from his house 
in uh, Dharamsala. Interestingly, for this guy you know, who is all about peace and compassion, you have to go through Indian armed guards with bayonets and an uh, a airport-like security procedure to get into this compound. Once you're in it, it's beautiful. Uh, the, the Indian government has protected him since he first fled uh, from uh, Tibet and have given him property there and, and everything. So uh, here's me. I said last night, jokingly, I tried to set the Dalai Lama straight about yeah. attachment and non-attachment. <laughs> but actually, he, he's as uh, reputed to be very smart, very good uh, listener, asked wonderful questions and everything over the course of a week. And I had prepared this part of my talk to say, I know from reading 12 Buddhist books on the airplane on the way over here that your goal is non-attachment, and mine is attachment security. And he said it, it's that the idea that you could achieve non-attachment by yourself, this is what I thought. The American books make it sound like literally, you can have a little altar in your bedroom, and you'll do all this by yourself and everything will be transformed. He said the original, the Buddha always says in his lectures, monks, you know, he's talking about a, a, an extended community, highly interactive with him being a kind of revered teacher. And the Dalai Lama said, everyone has at least one of those revered teachers in this tradition and they're part of a community. And there were 40 monks there. I, I didn't want to load this down with pictures of Dalai Lama land, but there were 40 monks there in the uh, robes and stuff. And he said, to them, I am that person. I am that security providing person. You know, they're revered teacher. So he was, he's very open to the idea. And he said, what they, what they mean that's translated in English as non-attachment is not clinging and grasping. And clinging and grasping is exactly the way anxious attachment had been described in the attachment literature. So anyway, I came back from this and then I was even more ensconced in a Buddhist network of neuroscientists and psychologists. And so um, 10 other uh, people, and now it's like 30 other people, uh, got grant support from the Fetzer Institute to do a study of intensive meditation training in this Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And it's called the Shamatha Project. This is a drawing by one of the uh, student researchers uh, on the project. And this is really complicated, but we had two three-month retreats at the Shambhala Mountain Center in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. The Shambhala Mountain Center looks like that. And we uh, got initially 60 people, uh, adults of various ages, into two matched groups. One of them went on a retreat for three months there, and the other one didn't, except we flew them in there to be tested at the beginning, the middle, and the end, like the people who were in the retreat says. So they were a control group, match for age and gender and so on. And then the way we got everyone to be willing to participate in is those people then went on their own three month retreat at, at this place. So everyone eventually was in a treat, retreat, but for the first retreat we have a control group and then we have what happened to the control group when they became retreatants. They, uh, it's a beautiful place by the way. The teacher in this, Alan Wallace, was a Buddhist monk working with the Dalai Lama for 14 years, went to Stanford to get a PhD in religious studies and married a famous Sanskrit scholar. So he was demonked uh, at that point, you know, by choice. And he um, has written really interesting books. The one for this project, sort of a manual for it, is called The Attention Revolution. And so the whole focus was on increasing attention originally to breathing and then to mental states and things like that. And we built a, a laboratory in another one of their meditation halls, air conditioned, soundproof, two little rooms, one for the subject with a video screen, speakers, an infrared camera that could take all their facial expressions, EEG recording, heart rate and all this stuff, and a little experimenter's room. And I cut the pictures from this because it would make it too long uh, today, but it really, it was a beautiful facility that allowed us to do priming experiments, cognitive experiments, attention experiments, and things like that. We also took blood samples, saliva samples, and things like that. So it's a big project. It would take another uh, talk to talk about it. But we published several papers from this 
so far, and I just want to tell you about them. I'm going to say a little bit more about this, but over the three months, the people get into a more and more positive affective state measured by the usual PANIS uh, positive negative affect scale. They literally have improved attention, which we measured in various ways. One is they actually lowered their perceptual thresholds. They, act, they were able to see things faster and better than the people in the control group. And we used standard uh, sustained attention where you're trying to do a boring judgment task. Originally, it was based on the idea that airport air traffic controllers have to look at a screen and keep track of all these planes, things like that. They got significantly better uh, over time as a result of it. So this was the first simple thing we're testing. Does learning to control your attention to your breathing, to internal states, to mental states, and things like that, improve your attention in these more general ways, and it does. Another, really, another one of these amazing things. On the project, we have uh, a woman named Liz Blackburn from the UCSF Medical Center who won the Nobel Prize for research about telomerase, which is an enzyme that repairs the ends of chromosomes. And over your lifespan, this stuff, uh, the telomeres, start to erode, and then it causes cell replication not to be perfectly accurate, and it makes it more likely you'll have cancer disintegration of various kinds. So she also has done some studies with colleagues showing that if you're caring for an Alzheimer spouse, which is really stressful over a long period of time, the telomerase levels go down, and the, that person literally will die sooner uh, as a result of that. So one of the amazing things is that in our study, this three-month meditation retreat measurably increased their telomerase levels in a way that seems likely to increase the length of their lives, especially if they continue that uh, practice. They have lower, uh, especially afternoon cortisol levels, which is a sign of reduced stress. And I'm not going to talk about it at all, but since we have all this EEG data, there are now uh, papers beginning to put together about the changing patterns that you can see in the brain related to their increased attentional and emotion regulation abilities. Um, I, during the night when I uh, woke up when a siren was on outside the hotel, I realized I should have put in a picture. One of the tasks is watching movie clips that we chose to be very emotional in various ways. And what you see from the infrared camera is that the people who've gone to the retreat show stronger sadness reactions to people being traumatized in the film. These are Hollywood type of films. Um, and it's, it's something that we cried ourselves when we were choosing those clips. And you see the people with the electrodes all over their head you know, tears streaming down, but they, act, they become, they show less contempt, less rejection, even of behavior that they uh, probably agree with us is bad on the part of American soldiers in Iraq, for example, reduced contempt and increased compassion and sadness. Uh, so here's an example of the, uh, the kind of data. Over, over the days, this is the way the positive affect scores went up in the first retreat group this is the control group, and then this is the control group once they entered their own retreat. So they definitely felt better uh, subjectively. In itself, that data wouldn't convince anybody of anything much because they spent three months there doing this full time. You know, they'd better think that they're feeling better. Uh, but this is why the physiological measures are important. They really were better. They were better off uh, as a result of doing it. On a lot of self-report measures, we saw increases in mindfulness, which I'll talk about in a second, positive affect, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness, which are three of the big five personality traits that have been shown to relate to length of life, length of marriage, success on jobs, things like that. And they decreased in depression, anxiety, and especially I want to mention here, on our scales, they became lower in attachment anxiety and avoidant attachment, at least according to the scales, and by self-reports, they became better at emotion regulation. They had less trouble with emotion regulation. Here's um, when we put all of those good and bad things together on a single factor that uh, we called adaptive functioning. All of those measures tend to have moved up in a good way um, across the retreat. And I just want to show you that what happens is in the retreat, 
their score on that composite scale goes up, and five months after they've gone home, it's still way higher than it was when they started. <clears throat> and we also know that if they maintain their meditation practice, they are more likely to sustain the effects uh, of the retreat. Here's the, the blue line is the control group. And then I hope, yeah, so when they went into their retreat, they show the same pattern of the people in the first uh, retreat. So definitely the, the people felt that they were functioning better in a number of ways. One of the things that interested me just as a sidelight is that our measures are related to the, I think, most commonly used five-dimensional measure of mindfulness, very complex differentiated measure. And I don't have time to uh, talk a lot about it, but here's attachment anxiety and total mindfulness, negative 0.52. Uh, even when we control for avoidance, it's minus 39. Here's the score, avoidance correlated with the mindfulness score, minus 53. It stays at minus 40 after you control for anxiety. So the, there are independent contributions of anxiety and avoidance scores to predicting these mindfulness aspects. And some of them are more important than others. Like here's non-reactivity to inner experience means you can let things arise in your mind without clinging and grasping, get, getting over-involved in it, or without having to suppress it. And what you see is the anxious people and the avoidant ones can't not react. Their own experience is that they, things arise in their mind. And I found to my surprise that in Pema Chodron's book called Living with Uncertainty, she's a Buddhist uh, nun who's done a lot of interesting writing and speaking, um, she described what's going to happen to you once you're calmly meditating and th letting things arise in your mind. And she literally says there are two kinds of, of problems that can develop. One is this will arise and you'll get totally engaged in it and upset and wound up emotionally and forget what you're doing. And the other is you're going to get a sense something is arising in your mind and you don't want to experience it. <laughs> so the, the uh, anxiety and avoidance patterns that we've been studying are there in the meditation literature. And I assume that they've been there you know, for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, so I, I think every sensitive person thinking about the way the mind works, sort of saw these different patterns that we're trying to measure. <clears throat> um, because of this issue, you know, this funny issue of non-attachment versus attachment, uh, one of uh, the people on the project, Baljinder Sadra, who had a, she's from India, had a PhD from Canada in social psychology, my field. And she was very interested in this whole, you know, so what is non-attachment? And she did a lot of meditation training herself began to talk to te meditation teachers and everything, and then looked into the literature and found out that attachment in this clinging and grasping sense, according to the, the scholarly writings, means possessiveness, a sense of ownership of persons or things, jealousy, clinging, preoccupation, defensiveness, compulsion, a bunch of things that um, I've been trying to describe to you. And non-attachment, uh, in contrast, is about lack of anxiously fixating on things or trying to hold on to things so they don't change. And not being reactive, I just showed you that's a dimension of mindfulness in the measure of mindfulness. Recovering more quickly from upset, letting things go, not being uh, obsessive about troubles and things like that. So we wrote, I don't remember the number, but like 150, 250 something possible non-attachment questionnaire items. And then Belgender sent them out to these scholars and meditation teachers, and, and they rated each item on how good that is as an indicator of non-attachment. And we created a standard kind of American psychology questionnaires for needs. It's called the Non-Attachment Scale. It's published in 2010. And here's an exa some examples. I can enjoy the pleasures of life without feeling sad or frustrated when they end. Instead of avoiding or denying life's difficulties, I face up to them. I don't have to hang on to the people I love at all costs. I can let them go if they wish to go. If things aren't turning out <clears throat> the way I want, I get upset. It's a reverse scored item. I experience acknowledge grief following significant losses, but I don't become overwhelmed, devastated, or incapable of meeting life's other demands. So you get the idea. So one of the things I want to show you is that scores on that scale 
are negatively related to especially anxious attachment, the way we measure it significantly, but not as much to avoid an attachment. So basically, I think the idea of non-attachment means non-anxious attachment. And I've told you all along, we're viewing the opposite end of that as security. So I think that what's being called non-attachment there is partly a security of the kind that I think goes along uh, originally rooted in security providing relationships of various kinds. But I think as you get older, it is partly internalized, carried around uh, with you. Um, interestingly, too, that non-attachment scale is related negatively to measures of materialism. Um, it's related to positive relationships, personal growth, to the mindfulness measure. So something in this odd area of security, mindfulness, and quotes, non-attachment, non-anxious clinging attachment, I, I think is all sort of pointing at the same underlying uh, stuff. And meditation increases people's scores on that scale. When we had uh, 85 meditators, 85 matched non-meditators, there's a significant difference. If you look at the people who practice meditation more than three hours a week, the difference is especially large uh, compared with their match controls on gender and SES, things like that. So in line with the idea that when you meditate, you could lower your scores on anxious and avoid an attachment, and I think become able to regulate yourself in a less defended way, uh, it, it fits with the emerging uh, meditation literature. So my time is up almost exactly a couple of conclusions. Attachment theory has turned out to be wonderful <laughs> as a stimulus for research. It's it just amazing to me that it could uh, generate everything that it has. Our priming studies and other kinds of uh, studies of real relationships show that security inductions administered consciously or subliminally have beneficial effects on mood, mental health, and interpersonal relations. Security can evidently be boosted by positive human relationships, by religious beliefs. I didn't focus a lot on it, but I think that when religion functions well, it's functioning very similar to good relationships. And it's often, as you know, related to good relationships in a religious community. And it seems like it can be boosted by meditation practices. Our work implies that security and insecurity lie at the heart of a wide variety of psychological, social, and religious processes both beneficial and destructive. And as I said in the beginning, I think, you know, whatever all of this is pointing to, I think it's the rudiments of a more general theory of security and its relation to cognition, defenses, maturity, pro-social attitudes and values, but that fully satisfying integrative theory is still for me a dream. Thanks. Wow, what a <laughs> wonderful presentation. You know, I've, I'm struggling because you've got maybe think about two clinical problems I would love to ask you about uh, <coughs> while Lex picks up the uh, cards from the audience. But uh, I'm going to start by uh, asking you to th uh, about a, something you didn't exactly mention, but it's really been on my mind for about the last 10 years, and that's problems in professionalism as one of the biggest predictors of malpractice suits, of poor patient satisfaction, and poor response to uh, uh, medical errors in our, our field. And I've never seen any studies, but I would assume that insecure and avoidant attachment are major issues that predict problems in professionalism. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, I mentioned this, the studies of the Israeli army. That was sort yes. of our first uh, step into leadership of that kind. A an interesting thing, by the way, too, is that the leaders themselves and their superiors and their soldiers all converged on their degree of avoidance. I mean, it's something that everyone, including the people themselves, noticed. I think in some cases the leaders were proud of it. It's sort of, if, if you interview them, it's sort of, yeah, we don't want this namby-pamby you know, who's suffering and that kind of stuff. That sounds way too painfully like uh, some of my colleagues yeah. in <laughs> academic medicine, right? Yeah, so I, I do think that people are, are beginning to look at it in organizational psychology, and it, it, that's specifically an interesting, very researchable issue. 
So if I could get you to be a consultant at Baylor in this <laughs> new professionalism initiative that we're about to undertake, what would you think would be things we ought to measure, which you may have just alluded to, but also types of interventions that we might want to consider in a not quite clinical pro, uh, pro, uh, group? The, the best of the, uh, for me, the, the model of interventions, because they're further along with it, are with parent-child relationship. There's one, for example, that I, it's easy for me to describe called circle of security. And it involves um, just explaining to young parents, and often because of where the grant money is available, these are in at-risk ghetto population, that kind of thing, um, showing them the way a baby is built, that it really could be the way a person is built, that they're going to want to do things on their own, explore, as Ainsworth called it, but they're going to want your support while they're doing that. So the circle idea is that the kid is going to go out and do these things, but check back if you're with them or not, and they're going to come back for refueling. And a combination of that kind of educational thing, showing videotapes of good and bad performance of this, and then intensive interviewing with them about the way they were parented, begin to you know, open the door to changing. And a lot, at least in those samples, a lot of the people actually say, wow, nobody ever told me this is what babies are like. So, I think, so basically, I would, I would model a more adult intervention on this idea of this is what people need. And their health, your relationship with them, everything else is going to function better if you look for this, if you're sensitive to it, things like that. It, it, it wouldn't be easy, but I think you could make a dent in it because usually they've reinforced. One of the thing, another thing, that a kind of mystery to me, is that we can measure this kind of thing in infants and they're totally nonverbal at age one. But then when we interview them or questionnaire them later on, they've built a whole ideology around this. I, I don't know how it goes in Texas, but I think of Dick Cheney as the model of the avoidant uh, person. <laughs> Uh, because because he, he, he had the ideology that I think grows up around what's originally an affective pattern. And that is, yeah, the wimps are suffering, they're whining. I mean, Romney showed it actually in the Florida, the 47% thing. 40% of them are whining wimps who are dependent on the government and we're not going to be able to talk sense to them. That attitude is part of avoidance. It's sort of, it's saying they're a bunch of scrawny black cats. <laughs> And I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, it's their problem. I'm fine. Uh, it's their problem. So that's what you want to change. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that, that is beautiful. So I'm going to be compassionate and not ask the other 10 questions I, <laughs> I have. And I will read a few here. What would you tell a young mother to do if she finds herself with children exhibiting avoidance or anxiety insecurities? Yeah, so that is what the, I, I highly recommend uh, this thing. If you Google circle of security, I think you'll come to the group of people who work on this clinically. And I know they're writing a book about it now. I, I attended one of their workshops just sort of see what they do. And it's really moving in addition to being really informative. So basically, the, the, I, I didn't talk much about this, but what's known from research is the kid becomes anxious if the primary parent is anxious too and is what I call personally distressed in our compassion study. That is, when, thing, when any kind of tension arises, their concern is with themselves and their own feelings. And when they're like that, they lose track of the other person's needs. So what, what needs to be done, I don't know how easy it is to do this, but I don't know if you do it cognitively, like t telling them about it, but part of circle of security is telling them about it. The, the kid needs attention. And they, they are going to get more upset, you know, more stride, more difficult to deal with if they perceive that your attention and caring are unreliable. And that unreliability is what causes the anxious kid. By the way, this is cross-generational, so it's anxiety produced anxiety. This made the genes people think in the beginning it's probably just inherited, but it's not mostly inherited. The avoidant ones, you know, in a certain way it's going to be harder because you have to explain to them as weird as it is that this is what a kid needs. They, they need your kind attention. The avoidant parents can actually be very likable on video if they're playing a game with a kid and the kid doesn't need or want anything. 
Their, their avoidance comes about when there's suddenly an emotional demand on them from the kid and they don't like feeling that. So this is what's hard about it. I mean, to get them to change this pattern to this is what the child needs, you know, I, th I think would, would require uh, quite a bit of work, but that's the idea. Avoidant parents create avoidant kids and they seem to do it by when the child needs something, they're in either symbolically or some way communicating, they're backing away when the kid expresses a need. So the thing I showed you, the evidence for suppression, I think they learn the suppression right there, that they're gonna get less of what they need if they ask for something. And so all of that, you know, I, I think, I do try to explain it to my students. I don't know how effective it is just to explain it. I think that's what the circle of security people have great videotapes and everything demonstrating how things can go awry. And sometimes the parents recognize themselves uh, or recognize the way they were parented when they see the video examples of it. A different uh, intervention type uh, question. As, uh, what are your experience with thoughts about neurofeedback and its influence on anxiety and avoidance? Yeah, so an interesting uh, thing I think is that once I, everyone on the Shamatha Project agreed to go to at least one week full-time meditation retreat. So I did that. And Alan Wallace, our teacher, was the teacher for the thing I went to. And it was uh, for psychologists and neuroscientists held in, in Santa Barbara. So we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that every, let's say, psychoanalysis. If I think of psychoanalysis from the point of view of, of Buddhism and meditation, Freud somehow came to this thing of the patient is going to lie down, the therapist is going to be out of the patient's sight, and the patient is going to be, uh, now I say it in a boost way, encouraged to allow things to arise in their mind <laughs> and not defend against them. You know, to say no matter how crazy, how embarrassing like that, let this arise. So all of it, I think, is a combination of re physical relaxation combined with allowing things to arise in the mind that then can be talked about. So when behaviorism came in, and at least in academic American psychology sort of pushed psychoanalysis out of the way, they came up with systematic desensitization, deep muscle relaxation <laughs> combined with a hierarchy of threatening stimuli, starting with the least threatening. And really the idea was, we're going to let this arise in your mind until it's really uncomfortable, and then we're going to go back to physical relaxation. So then when I'm at my one week meditation retreat in Santa Barbara, I see the whole thing is going to be concentrating your breathing, get rid of one of the most amazing things that Wallace said in the first days, he said, I know all of you are going to be type A <laughs> research and everything. So I, I want you to sense where the tension is in your body and get rid of it. So I was starting to do that and thinking of this as my body. And he said, especially around your eyes. And I realized when he said that, my eye muscles were, <laughs> like, they, my eyes have been hurting for 40 years you know, from <laughs> overreading. So the whole thing was first, establish the ability to maintain this physical relaxation. Then when you get to allowing, allowing things to rise in your mind, as I said, especially if you are scoring high on our anxiety scale, it's going to arise and you're going to get lost in it. Uh, Mary Main called this preoccupation. You're just lost if you're, she, in her adult attachment interview, she codes the person toward anxiety if they say, what was the question? And, and what you see when you do that is they lost track of the interviewer and the interviewer's question while they wound around in their own anxious mind. And the avoidant one is going to be suppressing things. You don't want to think about this. And when you do that, you lose the physical relaxation. So I, I think the secret of every procedure that any thoughtful person ever came up with is to remain relaxed and sort of not invested in defending yourself while you acknowledge what's really true about what's in you and what's outside in the world. Uh, I, I think it's, it's potentially simple, but it's difficult to accomplish. So we're going to do one more out of an, an awful lot of good questions here. Uh, this is a sort of psychoanalytic one and it used to be called repetition compulsion, but it's asked as where does physical abusiveness relate to the tendency for uh, the victims of ch sexual abuse as a child to pick out abusive uh, partners as... Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it is what uh, Freud called repetition compulsion. And I think the, this is what Bowlby meant by internal working models, that there, there is a record of some kind from repeated interactions with a certain kind of uh, parent, usually, but it could be grandparent, daycare worker, or whatever. And that whole thing, the expectations that go with it, and possibly the excitement of it. In, in my, among my friends, ones who had, uh, women who had alcoholic fathers, some of them have told me after I get to know them well, that they can get in an elevator and feel attracted to someone. And then once they get involved with them, they find out he is an alcoholic. They, they can, they're attracted to it. Um, why, in the case, on a specific case I'm thinking of, she said her dad used to come home drunk, turn on all the lights, scream, you know, yell at people and everything. So her idea of excitement, sort of somebody who's really going to jack up or arousal levels is that kind of bad uh, behavior. So she could tell me this because years of psychotherapy and her focusing on this kind of issue made her realize that being attracted in the elevator is not necessarily a good, <laughs> a good, a good basis. But I think so, yeah, I think that the, the whole, Bowlby was a psychoanalyst. And so he called these internal working models because he wanted to focus on emerging cognitive psychology. But it's, there, there are patterns that are leading to expectations, arousal, conditioned emotional reactions, all those kinds of things. And some of them are uh, involved with attractions. It's familiar. You know, somebody, you, you might have had, we are usually, when you're talking about abuse, you're usually talking about the abusive aspects of the relationship. But sometimes that same person was funny, a good guitarist, you know, fun to go horseback riding with, stuff like that. So it's a, a, the representation of those things is complicated. So you sort of making me wonder if we can define a corrective emotional experience or not. Uh, Probably shuts off at a certain time. <laughs> Dr. Shaver was asking, making me think of whether we can design a corrective emotional experience or not. Our first ex uh, episode of that didn't go all that well. But we don't have, we want to give you a 15 minute break and then bring you back. So uh, that's what we're going to do next. Thank you so much for getting us off to a great start. <laughs>